Hello and welcome to episode four of my sports and exercise science series. We're going to be following on from episode three by beginning to learn about the skeletal system. The more you learn about the skeleton, the more you'll realize what an incredible piece of engineering it is. The human skeleton contains approximately 206 bones and 100 joints that offer the body strength and support as well as flexibility and agility. It often surprises people that only 8-10% to of your body weight comes from your bones. So if this is the case, how come bones are so strong but weigh so little? How come bones are both rigid and flexible? And what are the three main functions of the skeletal system? Firstly, let's look at the structure of bones. Bones are hollow structures made up of composite material and contain both calcium, which is a hard mineral, and collagen, which is a flexible protein. Why is this important? Well, if bones were just made of calcium, they would shatter, and if bones were just made of collagen, they would be too elastic and they would bend like rubber. Combining both calcium and collagen together, however, means that bones are not only strong, they can also bend in response to activity. If you jump up in the air as high as you can, your body can absorb the impact when you land and bones will resist the force by bending ever so slightly. If you've seen a skeleton in a classroom, it gives the illusion that bones are really hard and solid throughout, when in actual fact, just the outside of bones are. Inside bones, there are interconnecting arches with the same appearance of honeycomb. This structure enables bones to be light, house blood and nerves, and be the hub of microscopic activity. Whilst bone density goes down as we get into later life, bone mass is constantly regenerating at a fast rate. This means that every seven to 10 years, you effectively get a new skeleton. Let's now look at the regeneration of bone. How does the body do this? And what are the three main players involved in this process? There are three microscopic organisms that have the responsibility of breaking down and rebuilding bone. And these include osteoblasts, osteoclasts, and osteocytes. Osteoblasts are cuboidal cells which have a single nucleus and they function to synthesize bone. Osteoblasts are mainly located on the outer surface of bone and when they are undergoing bone formation, they work as a group of cells together. Once old bone has been destroyed, osteoblasts lay down fresh collagen and coat it with new minerals. Next we have osteoclasts. Osteoclasts are responsible for the breakdown of bone. They are much larger than osteoblasts and are multinucleated. You can find osteoclasts on the surface of bone mineral next to dissolving bone. Osteoclasts destroy old, worn out bone by spraying it with hydrochloric acid. Finally, we have osteocytes. Once new bone has been built by osteoblasts, the osteoblasts trap themselves within the new bone they've made and become osteocytes. Osteocytes function to send messages to other cells about the state of bone, so areas of bone repair or growth can be identified. This now leads us onto the functions of the skeleton. The three main functions of the skeleton are to support the body, give attachment sites, and to provide levers for movement. Let's now look at these three functions in more detail. So how do bones support the body? Let's start with the brain and heart. The brain is protected by the skull or the bones of the cranium and the heart is protected by the ribs. Bones provide structural support and help to maintain the posture and shape of the body. For example, bones at the top of the body are smaller in comparison to those at the bottom of the body. The bones of the lower and upper limbs are both made up of the same structure, three long, thin bones. But the bones of the lower body are significantly thicker to help with weight bearing. The skeleton also supports the body by housing bone marrow, which produces red blood cells. These red blood cells carry oxygen to all parts of the body and remove carbon dioxide. Bone marrow also houses white blood cells, which help to protect the body from disease and foreign invaders, and platelets, which help to prevent bleeding. The skeleton offers attachment sites for different tissues to attach to bone such as ligaments and tendons from muscles, so bones provide a rigid framework for the body. This framework provides the strength needed to support the body. Attachment sites act as anchors for muscles that contract or move bones through joints. Some bones have a variety of different attachment points, for example the scapula, which offers an attachment point for 18 different muscles. Bone attachment points can be described as borders, holes, protrusions and notches. Finally, the skeleton provides levers for movement. 
When a muscle contracts, it pulls on bone and together they work to provide movement. Next, we're going to cover the major bones and joints of the body. We've already established that the mature adult skeleton consists of approximately 206 bones. But did you know you used to actually have more bones? A baby skeleton consists of around 300 bones and many fuse together to form single bones. Let's start by going through the skeleton from top to bottom. From the top, we have the skull, which consists of 29 bones. This is made up of eight cranial bones, 13 facial bones, six ear ossicles, and the hyoid bone, which can be found below the jaw at the top of the neck. The skull connects onto vertebrae, which have four main regions that make up the spine. These four regions include your cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacroiliac vertebrae, which we'll touch on in more detail later on in the episode. There are 33 vertebrae in total, connected through intervertebral joints. The chest contains 12 pairs of ribs that are attached directly and indirectly to the sternum. The sternum attaches to the clavicle at the sternoclavicular joint and the clavicle forms part of the shoulder joint along with the scapula. They provide a shallow socket for the head of the humerus to fit into the glenohumeral head. Moving down, the humerus attaches to the ulnar and radius which are connected to the carpal joints that make up the wrist. There are a total of eight carpal bones and the hand is made up of five metacarpal bones. Each metacarpal forms a joint with the phalanges that make up the fingers. There are a total of 14 phalanges, three in each finger and two in the thumb. In the lower limb, we have the pelvis, which is made up of the fusion of three bones. These are the ilium, ischium and pubis. The pelvis connects to the upper leg by way of the hip joint, which is a deep socket for the head of the femur. At the knee joint, the femur connects to the tibia at the femorotibial joint and the patella at the femoropatella joint. The lower leg consists of the tibia and fibula bones that form joints at the ankle with the tarsals, seven large bones of the heel. The foot has five metatarsal bones, which lead to 14 phalanges to make up the toes. Each toe has three phalanges apart from the big toe, which only has two. Let's now focus in more detail on the spine, which deserves its own section. Your spine, which can also be called your backbone or vertebral column, is made up of 33 bones called vertebrae, which provide your body with support and protect your spinal cord from injury. The vertebrae can be divided into four to five sections, known as your cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccyx. The sacral and coccyx vertebrae in some textbooks are grouped together. We have seven cervical vertebrae, numbered C1 to C7, 12 thoracic vertebrae, numbered T1 to T12, five lumbar vertebrae, numbered L1 to L5, five sacral fused vertebrae, numbered S1 to S5, and the coccyx contains four fused rudimentary vertebrae. However, in some people, this can differ between three to five fused vertebrae. The cervical vertebrae of your neck help to support your head, which weighs between 10 to 13 pounds. C1 and C2 have the greatest range of movement and allow you to nod your head forward and back, as well as rotate from side to side. The average thickness of the cervical vertebrae is three millimeters, whereas the thoracic vertebrae is six millimeters and lumbar nine millimeters. Cervical vertebrae sacrifice strength for mobility. The thoracic vertebrae of your mid and upper back have limited range of motion and hold the rib cage, helping to protect the heart and lungs. The lumbar vertebrae are the thickest vertebrae. This is due to the lumbar vertebrae having to bear the weight of the upper body and its role in absorbing shock and stress. The role of the sacral vertebrae is to connect your spine to your hip bones. The sacral vertebrae and your pelvis are often referred to together as the pelvic girdle. Finally, the coccyx or tailbone is an important attachment point for ligaments and muscles of the pelvic floor. If you look at the spine from the back, it will seem straight. However, if you look at the spine side on, you'll notice that the spine has four slight curves, similar to an elongated S shape. Why is this? Well, the curves are crucial for maintaining spinal health throughout your life. Your spine is a shock absorber, so think of it like a spring. When you walk, run and jump, you're applying force onto your body 
and your spine then helps to disperse that force. So what are these four curves of the spine? We have the lumbar curve, thoracic curve, cervical curve and sacral curve. You may have heard of these already as they're common terms used by doctors and physical therapists. Both the cervical and lumbar curves are shaped inwards, these are known as lordotic curves, and the thoracic and sacral curves are shaped outwards and known as kythotic curves. These four curves are split into two sections, primary and secondary curves. A primary curve is what you was born with and a secondary curve is what you have developed. Your kyphotic, thoracic and sacral curves are primary curves, whereas your lordotic, cervical and lumbar curves are your secondary curves. Babies are not actually born with an S-shaped spine, they're born with a C-shaped spine. Weird, huh? Let's now learn about the five different classifications of bones in the body. Long bones. A long bone is a bone longer than it is wide. Remember, the term long bone describes the shape of the bone and not the bone size. Long bones can be found in the arms and legs, such as the humerus and femur, as well as the fingers, such as the metacarpals and phalanges. Short bones. A short bone is one that is cube-like in shape, for example, being approximately equal in length, width and thickness. The only short bones in the body are the carpals of the wrists and tarsals of the ankles. Short bones function to provide support and stability. Flat bones. This one can be a little bit confusing. Although a flat bone is typically thin, it can actually be curved. Examples of flat bones in the body include the scapula and the sternum. Flat bones function to not only protect internal organs, but serve as attachment points for muscles. Irregular bones. These are bones that do not have any characterized shape and therefore do not fit into other classifications. An example of an irregular bone would be the vertebrae, which have a complex shape. Sesamoid bones. Sesamoid bones are characterized as small and round. These bones form in tendons where a great deal of pressure is generated on the joint, such as the patella. Let's finish this episode by looking at joints. A joint can also be called an articulation and is where adjacent bones or bone and cartilage come together. So they articulate with each other and form a connection. Joints can be both mobile or immobile. Immobile joints serve to protect vital organs and give the body stability, whereas mobile joints help to allow for extensive movement of the body and limbs. Joints are put into three different types of classification by type of tissue, including fibrous, bones connected by fibrous tissue, cartilaginous, bones connected by cartilage, and synovial, articulating surfaces enclosed within fluid-filled joint capsule. Fibrous joints function to be strong and stable. They are bound by tough fibrous tissue. Cartilaginous joints are united by fibrocartilage and hyaline cartilage and allow for more movement than fibrous joints, but are less mobile than synovial joints. Synovial joints are defined by the presence of a fluid-filled joint cavity contained within a fibrous capsule. They are freely movable and are the most common type of joint in the body. There are six subcategories for synovial joints and these include hinge joints. These joints permit movement in one plane, usually flexion and extension, for example the knee or elbow joints. Saddle joints. Often these are characterized by opposing articular surfaces such as the carpometacarpal joints. These crudely resemble the shape of a saddle. Plane joints. The articular surfaces of plane joints are relatively flat, allowing bones to glide over one another. An example of a plane joint would be the acromioclavicular joint. Pivot joints. These allow for rotation only. The joint is formed by a central bony pivot, which is surrounded by a body of ligamentous ring. For example, the atlantoaxial joint. Condyloid joints. These joints contain a convex surface which articulates within a concave elliptical cavity. This joint can be found in the wrist. Finally, we have the ball and socket joint, the joint most people are aware of. The ball-shaped surface of a bone fits into the cup-like depression of another bone, permitting free movement in numerous axes, such as the hip and shoulder joint. That concludes the fourth episode of my sports and exercise science series. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and don't forget to like and subscribe 
for more free and educational content. You've been watching UK Fitness Hub, I've been Travis Tarrant, and I'll see you in the next episode where we begin study on the muscular and nervous system.